On her 16th birthday, Himari Momochi receives a letter stating she has inherited a mansion. Having been raised in an orphanage, this mansion is the only thing left by her real family, so she pays no mind to the rumors that it may be haunted. Upon entering, she finds Aoi and his companions squatting in her new home, and even though they tell her to leave, she's determined to find a way to kick all of them out. This is until she finds out the house sits between the world of the living and the spirit realm after getting attacked by yokai. Even more surprising, Aoi was chosen to be the guardian of her home, given special demonic powers for a price that he refuses to tell her. Find out the price he paid in the exciting plot of The Demon Prince of Momochi House. So let's get started and watch the story unfold. Himari Momochi is an orphan girl whose parents died when she was a baby. She spent her whole life at an orphanage, where even though everyone was nice to her, she couldn't help but wonder what her parents were like, until one day, she received a gift from her late parents for her 16th birthday. Why now? Who knows? She was just happy to finally feel like she was part of a family, as the gift she received was a huge house that made her eyes glimmer. She asked if anyone's home, but wait, this is her home. She walks through her house walkway until she spots a boy in the nude? She screams, asking who he is and why he's naked. It. Then two men tackle him to the ground while clothing him. Himari stares at them, but as she's about to question what they're doing in her home, the boys ask her if she's a burglar? They have a civil discussion, where Himari introduces herself as the rightful owner of Momochi House. However, the purple-haired Yukari and red-haired Issei question her words. But without any inhibitions, the black-haired boy introduces himself as Aoi Nanamori and welcomes Himari while calling her by first name, which gets her taken aback. Himari asks the three boys why they're in her home, so Aoi casually tells her, it's because we decided to live here, which Himari responds to quizzically. Why are strangers in her home? Yukari and Issei say it's their home and tell her to kindly leave. And even though she thinks it's unfair, Yukari explains it's better she go home because this house is infamous for being haunted. Which reminded Himari that in the forest on the way here, when she asked for directions, people constantly told her not to go as the house was a home to unworldly demons. But she ain't afraid of no ghosts. She slams on the table the will left by her parents, which claims her ownership. Yukari reads it and tells her she's most likely being scammed, but she responds by telling the boys not to disrespect her parents. Their will is the first thing that's ever connected her to her family. Aoi responds kindly, telling her he's empathetic, but still says it's best she leaves, because her being here will only cause trouble. Himari tries to reiterate her point, but Yukari reminds her this house doesn't abide by the laws of the human world, and Issei claims Aoi to be the owner of the Momochi house, with the two almost getting into a fight. Aoi then tells the two to stop, and that either way Himari should stay for the night since it's getting dark, but tomorrow? Himari needs to go home. She was flabbergasted during her rest at night. Go home? To where? And who's he to tell me to stay the night anyway? This is supposed to be my house. While she lay on the futon, she wondered why the house was so dark, so cold, and with no electricity. She hears a little crackle and wonders what that is. Must be nothing, right? However, she couldn't be more wrong as she hears the laughter of children. She gets up completely startled remembering how the people she met along her way said this house was demonic. But she refused to accept this, saying there's no way and that she must be hearing things. She sees a strange being behind the screen divider, which frightens her and causes her to hide under her blanket, completely scared until she falls asleep. The next day, she gets up, determined to prove herself as the rightful owner of the house. Just like I'm determined to have you like this video and subscribe to my channel. Here at my Shoujo Weekly, I'll be sharing fun stories in anime, manga, and manhwa in the shoujo genre. Villainous main characters galore, handsome princess you adore, while all written by me and told by my voice. So come on, hit that subscribe, that way you and I can vibe. Anyways, she tries to start by making everyone breakfast but has no idea how to operate a traditional wood fire Kamado stove. Yukari asks what she's doing, but before she can even explain, he cuts her off to say breakfast has already been made and that she needs to eat so she can leave already. Himari marvels at the delicious looking breakfast made by Yukari, who explains Aoi was the one who told him to make it for her. But regardless, she was overjoyed to finally have someone to cook for her. She's grateful for the meal, and when she munches down, Yukari offers seconds, causing her to voraciously eat and graciously accept more. 
Okay, so cooking for everyone isn't going to work. Maybe she can clean the whole house to prove herself. After all, she was called the cleaning queen at the orphanage. She opens a room and wonders how it ended up such a mess, only to understand it's from Issei who wakes up from a nap, which pisses her off. Aoi then comes by to tell her good morning, but she's just thankful he's wearing clothes today. He remarks on how hardworking she is for cleaning the house so early in the morning, saying it's very admirable of her, which makes Himari light up a little. But even with the good intentions to clean, without electricity, she realizes cleaning will be really slow since she can't use a vacuum. She pulls up her phone and sighs, because there's still no phone service. Aoi asks her what the device is, as he's never seen a smartphone before. But when he grabs it, it suddenly explodes, leaving her completely completely phoneless now. Afterwards, as she begins sweeping the dust in the house with a broom, she thinks of the strange creature behind the screen divider from last night, then suddenly stumbles when she sees strange amalgamations appearing, telling her to leave the house over and over. She shrinks in fear at first, but then tells them it's her house. She screams, get out, which causes some small creatures in Issei to begin flying out of the black blobs. Aoi and Yukari go to check on her, and the three of them stare at Issei and the strange creatures in the bushes. With the creatures plus Issei tied up, Aori tells him it's punishment for stirring up these little guys, known as lesser yokai. Himari wants to know what's up with the stuffed animals that talk, so Aori explains their ayakashi, which include yokai and ghosts. However, Himari can only stare in disbelief. Aori asks her to forgive them for trying to scare her out, especially because these yokai have nowhere to go. She then asks Aoi if he's an Ayakashi, but Yukari interjects, saying Aoi isn't, but that he and Issei are, and that they loyally serve him. As the yokai squirm, Aoi tells Issei if he wants to be untied, he needs to apologize to Himari. Despite this, Himari smiles, saying, this is kinda nice. Looking at how Aoi, Yukari, and Issei treat each other. They act like family, like a family she's always wanted. But sadly, Aoi tells her she still has to leave because she doesn't belong here. That's right, she runs out frantically, even though Aoi tells her to wait. She felt embarrassed, even thinking for a second she might have found a place she actually belonged, that she could be one of them. As the forest becomes a dark purple, she's reminded it may be her house, but it's not where she belongs. Then a dangerous spirit appears, saying, it desires to drink the blood of the Momochi, which startles Himari and makes her fall. The boys come after her, but can only watch as the creature invades her insides. Aoi reacts quickly and puts his mouth to hers, sucking the vapors out. Himari awakens coughing, blushing because her first kiss was taken. The spirit, pissed at losing its prey, goes to strike. That's when Aori tells Himari she shouldn't look at him, and a blue light envelops him, revealing the creature from the other side of the screen divider from before. In this form, Aori is called Nue, which is a legendary spirit amongst the yokai. Aoi pulls up his amulet and commands Yukari and Issei to capture the giant Ayakashi. They run in and dodge its attacks, and quickly restrain the beast with sacred tether. Then, with the amulet fan opened, Aoi finishes the spirit off with a single stroke of light, turning the dark to day with a graceful finish. Himari stares at the beautiful creature before her. Then Yukari and Issei jump in to explain he's known as an Omamori, or the good luck charm of the Momochi house. The house was built at the barrier between the human and spirit realm, with Nue designated to be the true owner. But all of this is too much for Himari to take in, so she passes out, and awakens to Aori saying, if he can't save her, what has he lived all this time for? Then the three watch over her as Aori holds her hand. The next day, Aoi wakes up to Himari's voice after having held her hand all night as she rested. She's feeling good now, but not all is good as Aoi is sure she wants to leave after seeing the vengeful spirit from last night. However, she has no plans of leaving and thanks him for being concerned with her well-being. She may not remember her mom and dad's faces or voices, but she sure hopes she'll understand them by continuing to stay. And she looks forward to living with these guys, especially Aoi. But first things first, the three of them owe her rent. The next day, she wakes up screaming, discovering Aoi in her bed. She smacks him and asks why he's here. And he just responds, huh? I don't know. Maybe I was cold. With no sign of concern on his face whatsoever. So Himari smacks him again, calling him a creep, asking him just how old he is. But when he responds 17, she flashes back to when his kiss saved her and this makes her blush. But he honestly has no idea what he did wrong. 
Later, Himari finds the three boys lounging around and tells them that they still owe her rent money. But Aori doesn't have any, as they have had no living expenses to pay for. The lights are lit by fire yokai, water springs up on its own, and food supplies also suddenly appear, probably gathered by the lesser yokai. She then asks Aoi, what about school? But he just turns the question back at her, and we learn she'll be going to her new school soon. And since Aoi doesn't make money or even go to school himself, he should get a part-time job. However, Issei decides to pay Himari with a gecko instead. So she screams for him to get out, sending him an outrageous distance through the house. This most likely works because of her Momochi bloodline that the home is tied to. However, it looks like it only works with the words get out, since she can't command furniture or anything else to move. Later that night, Himari wanders the halls. She thinks about when Aoi had held her hand saying, if I can't save her, what have I lived for all this time? Wondering the meaning behind his words. She sees some purple smoke and hears the voice of Yukari telling Aoi he's pushing himself too hard, casting this barrier within the house. Then, when she hears Issei saying Aoi is doing this all for her sake, she runs over. With the three boys surprised to see her, Aoi asks for her to wait for him to get dressed before he explains himself. The two meet outside the room, where Himari comments on the fact that Aoi looked like he was suffering. He tells her not to worry, but how could she not? She asks him for the truth about what he was doing, and at first, he looks speechless, but he grabs her hand and gently asks what she would like to know. She asks him how he became Nue. He explains that several years ago, he wandered into the Momochi house and accidentally broke the seal. Since this house is built on the line between the human world and the spirit realm, it requires a protector to guard the line. Even scared out of his mind, he was chosen as a suitable candidate and granted the spiritual power of Nue. This is when Himari gained a grasp of the situation. If she had gotten here first, the house would have chosen her, especially with the Momochi blood in her veins. She felt terrible at the burden placed on Aoi, but he tells her it's not bad because the spelling Ayakashi is kind of cool, even though he has no income and can't pay rent. Himari then pries on when he had said he'd have nothing to live for if he couldn't save her, which causes him to give a concerned glance, and Himari sweats a bit, anticipating the potential horrid truth to come, but he just smiles, replying, hmm, did I ever say that? Making Himari feel like he's a bit of a liar. She couldn't sleep well, not knowing what secrets Aoi is keeping from her. She then hears the voice of a woman telling her to come. If she wants to heal her man, the fruit of the ancient cherry blossom tree can cure all with just a single bite. Himari, compelled by the tree, touches the fruit which rots immediately and the tree attacks her, looking to claim Himari's soul. But Aoi narrowly saves her, as we see the Ayakashi rear its ugly head from the tree. He transforms and commands Issei and Yukari to bind her, and easily defeats it with one swipe of his fan. And after all the events, he finds himself a little worn out from overusing his powers. Himari feels saddened because she can't do anything for him, but he's okay because he's just happy to see her smile. This cheers up her mood. Seriously? That's all he wants? She then notices the real cherry blossom petals that fall by her hand. There must be a late bloomer here somewhere. She pulls up Aoi and drags him to go find the Sakura tree with her, but when they make it to the entrance, the house barrier stops him at the front. We learn he cannot leave this house. She thinks what he claims is ridiculous, but understands when she tries to pull his hand through and gets pushed back. With Himari learning it's been seven years since he's been trapped in the Momochi house, she asks him what about his friends and family. However, Aoi had Issei and Yukari look into this, and it turns out it's fine since to his loved ones, it's as if he never existed. No one remembers him or knows who he is. Himari freaks out asking how he could be okay with this, but Aoi accepted his fate many years ago, fine with the place he belongs. As he walks away, her thoughts on everything begin flowing through her mind. When he had first told me to leave, I had no clue what he really meant. No clue how he felt. I didn't understand anything. She decides to ask Yukari about how things were when Aoi first entered the house. And we learned Aoi had frantically gone through every page of every book, desperate to find a way to escape the house. Until eventually, he gave up discussing the subject altogether. The truth makes Himari sick. She's the rightful heir to the Momochi house. She should have become the Omamori bound to protect the line between the human and spirit world. She should have been the one to be confined here. Both Yukari and Issei tell her to stop spouting nonsense because Aoi wouldn't want that for her anyways. 
and the two of them walk away, telling her to give up on this house and to stop upsetting their master. They don't want to see him saddened any longer. Himari decides to wander in the town with her thoughts, until a man picks up her handkerchief and gives it back to her. When he learns she's a student going to the high school he's teaching at, the man decides to sit down with her and to listen to her troubles. He understands that Himari is struggling to do something to help Aoi, but by doing this, she's most likely overthinking. Any choice we make can lead to regrets, so we should always strive to make decisions that we can look back on and say, I did my best. This makes her think of when Aoi had said all he wanted was to see her smile. Now with her resolve firm, she takes her leave. The evening comes and we see Aoi staring outside the house. He tells his two Shikigami that he just wants to stare out a bit longer. His only wish was that Himari leave the house safely. However, if he was never going to see her again, he wished that he had least seen her off with a smile. Then suddenly, we see a giant bag appear and burst with tons of supplies. Himari came home and on top of him. It's just that she lost her balance since her bag was so heavy. Aoi wonders what she's doing back here, and she explains that since she's going to be living here from now on, she might as well bring back as many supplies as she can, at least until she finds a way to get Aoi out of her house. And the mention of this causes all the boys to gasp. She's not doing this out of pity, but mark her words, she's going to find some way to kick him out. Aoi just smiles and welcomes her home, embracing her in this home that is hers. All while this mysterious onlooker has his sights set on the new way. Himari prepares herself for school and Aoi sees her off. She heads to class and she finds out that the teacher from before, Takamura Nachi, is actually her teacher. He then introduces her to the whole class and she's happy thinking she might fit in here until she finds herself bringing four of her classmates to see her house she inherited. There's Hana, Aika, Rui, and Tadashi, who is especially excited to see the real-life haunted Momochi house. Rui apologizes for imposing on Himari on her first day of school, but Tadashi wouldn't shut up about there being real ghosts. But he doesn't feel sorry at all, because the legend of the Omamori is something he had heard from his grandmother. Himari couldn't help but think she made the mistake of agreeing to this in an attempt to make friends, but she can't let them find out about the yokai living here. Before they came inside, she had to tell Aoi and the gang that she can't let her classmates know that she lives with a bunch of boys. So she asked them to come up with something. She was relieved that they agreed so quickly, but she knows something could still happen here regardless. So she needs to come up with an excuse to get her classmates out of her house as soon as possible. She tries to get up to make her friends some tea, but then enters Himari's self-proclaimed older sisters, in quotations, Yukariko, the second eldest, Iseko, and oldest sister, Aoiko, which leaves Himari wondering what the heck is going on here? She then sees the yokai behind them and it's clear her friends are never going to buy this. But somehow they do, with the girls remarking how pretty the sisters are, and even Tadashi trying to hit on Iseko. Aoi then grabs onto Himari and tells her he needs to borrow her for a bit. When they enter the other room, Aoi explains that out of all the friends she brought over, one of them is already dead and blending in with the group, a deceased soul disguised as a fourth friend, and that this soul is not an Ayakashi yet, but it could transform into one. This soul was most likely a wandering spirit at the school, but she invited them here as the owner of the Momochi house, and now the soul is rapidly soaking the house's spiritual power and turning into an Ayakashi. Himari asks which of them it is, but the problem is that Aoi and his familiars cannot tell either. Since the spirit is a guest of Himari's, Aoi is magically prevented from interfering with them, so they need her to figure out who it is. That way they can purify the soul, but if she guesses wrong, the Ayakashi might realize it's been discovered and go berserk, and even potentially harm the rest of her friends. Himari gains the resolve to handle the task, but when she walks in, she already notices something disturbing about Hana. But it turns out she just needs to use the bathroom. As Himari leads her to the bathroom, they walk by a mirror and Himari senses something ominous about Hana's reflection. But when asked about it, Hana has no idea what she's talking about. As she waits for Hana to finish using the restroom, she thinks about how she doesn't want to think of any of the friends she's made to be deceiving her. She suddenly hears a loud thud and sees Hana passed out in front of the bathroom door all while the man in red appears again, thinking of how he'll capture his dear Nue. The four examine Hana's body afterwards, and it turns out her soul is missing, but that has nothing to do with the wandering spirit, as they can all still sense its presence. Yukari tells Himari to look for something off, 
as a being from the spirit realm should be different from the rest of her friends who are still alive. Himari comes back to the room where her friends are, and after giving them the news that Hana is resting because she isn't well, the three friends get worried, so Himari leads them to where Hana is. As they walk, Aika explains she's happy to be hanging out with everyone today, as she took a lot of time off from school, and she's thankful to the person who gave her the courage to come back. Himari asks who that person is, but then senses an ominous presence. It's not from Aori and the gang, so she has to get everyone out of here and away from danger. She then hurries to her friends and asks again who Aika is talking about. But when she makes it over, Rui asks Himari who Aika is. In disbelief, Himari tries to tell them Aika is right there, but when looking at the mirror, she's shocked to find that Aika has no reflection. Rui then kindly proclaims that there's no one in their class they know as Aika, and it's become apparent that the rest of them couldn't see Aika from the start. She must be the ghost. Aori runs in and tells her to hurry and expel the spirit, but she points to the real culprit and shouts for it to leave instead. However, when the door opens revealing the true culprit, a miasma gets released that knocks out Rui and Tadashi. We then see a black aura emanating around Hana, who releases a black fire and reveals himself as Kasha, someone that Aoi and his familiars recognize would do something like this. Kasha asks who the girl is, but Aoi doesn't answer, telling Kasha he won't let him lay a hand on her. Kasha then shoots black flames at Himari, but Yukari and Issei are able to pull her away from the attack. This gives Aoi a chance to transform into Nue, but then we see Kasha summon Aiko before him. He whispers sweet givings to her, that in order to fulfill her desires, she must consume the Obamori, Aoi. Then magic comes bursting out at Aoi and his friends, and Himari can hear it. The voice of Aika saying she's lonely and that no one notices her. This is why she needs to become a strong Ayakashi. That way, everyone will notice her. Aoi prepares to obliterate her as it's better to do it now before she succumbs to Kasha's puppetry. But Himari marches forward to acknowledge Aika. She pulls her close and tells her, it's gonna be okay, and sees visions of her time being sickly in the hospital to her untimely demise at the hand of her sickness, to when she wandered around the school as a spirit looking for friends. Tears drip down Aika's face. She's sorry. She just wanted friends more than anything. But Himari forgave her and told her to stop talking like she didn't have anyone because they're already friends, aren't they? And with the power of friendship, Aika is able to pass on. However, Kasha remarks that the foolish spirit was so fragile, it wouldn't even make for decent amusement. He then takes off telling only Nue goodbye and disappears. Himari asks who that guy was, but all Aoi has to say is that Kasha is a powerful Ayakashi. He tells her to forget about him and brings her in close, apologizing to Himari for dragging her into his battles. Hana then wakes up, remembering she was on her way to the bathroom, and the rest of the friends get up too, only remembering the black mist. But Himari is able to scrape by with an excuse, blaming it on their broken chimney. Rui then adds that Tadashi must have inhaled some of the smoke and started hallucinating, and concludes this house isn't haunted at all. As the friends take their leave, Himari tries to approach Rui about all this, but Rui denies saying anything and says there must have been a good reason Himari's family was dressing up. Regardless, they happily said their goodbyes. The three boys of the Momochi house stare as a seal is about to break. They need to fix this in order to protect Himari. With her and the Ayakashi feeling uneasy, the little Ayakashi freak out even thinking about the powerful Kasha who comes from a noble lineage. But even so, Issei comes from a noble lineage himself, the Shoujo family, who possess noble flames so mighty the clan is both feared and respected as legendary yokai. Something that Himari sighs over as there's still so much she doesn't know. We turn back to Aoi resealing one of the doors, and even with the issue resolved, they wonder what Kasha's game and motive is. Himari comes over to ask the boys about Kasha herself, and Aoi teases her asking what she'll do for him if he tells her making her push him away after getting a little flustered. Okay, asking him isn't going to work, so she tries asking Issei since he's also a fire Ayakashi, but he doesn't take too kindly to being compared to Kasha since Issei thinks of his own flames as hotter. Well, since he's boasting so much, she asks him to remove the marks all over the house left by Kasha, but no one knows what she's talking about. She tries wiping one right in front of them, and Aoi is shocked asking if she sees something that they cannot, and she describes black wheels all around the house. The wheels then start to disintegrate within black flames, and the door Aoi had just finished resealing breaks, unleashing an attack on Himari that he has to block. 
Out comes a giant monster that Aori needs to purify, but he steps on one of Kasha's traps and gets ensnared. Hanging in the binding ropes, Aori warns his friends not to come near him as the ropes drain spiritual power. Yukari tries to break him free, but to no avail. Kasha's fire also absorbs spiritual power. Issei then unleashes his full power to try to help Aoi break free, and it's working, except that it seems to be burning his life force without Aoi's help. This time, Issei is determined to help his friends. Unlike that time, his clan casted him aside. They had placed a curse on him that would bring him to death if he used his power, something he chose to do to protect a dear friend of his once. He had woken up to a young Aoi, and the two made a pact with Issei becoming Aoi's Shikigami at the wish of his friend he tried to protect. So he'll do whatever it takes to protect Aoi, even burning his life away. Himari begs him to stop, but he can't. Yukari then explains that if they free Aoi, they can save Issei from dying as well. Kasha then appears before Aoi, taunting him, saying the reason why he couldn't see the marks is that he's already fully become an Ayakashi. And as he's about to fade into the dark flames, Himari calls out to Aoi and makes it to Aoi with the help of Yukari's shielding spell. She grabs onto the ropes, weakening the binding spell, which gives Yukari the opportunity to break the binds. And as Aoi falls, Himari reaches her hand out to him. With his powers regained, he gives Issei the authority to wipe out the enemy Ayakashi, so he unleashes a flame so powerful it blows the house apart. Himari is a little saddened by her house being destroyed, but Issei promises to fix it. She's pleased by this and also promises to help him since they're basically family now. Yukari and Aoi in the back praise Himari. She's someone who is unbound by rules and always acts true to herself. And especially to Aoi, she completes him in places he lacks. Yukari then asks how Aoi feels about what Kasha said when he said Aoi was no longer human. But Aoi understands Kasha was just trying to get under his skin. Himari smiles at him, so he walks over and embraces her, giving her a kiss on the cheek, an action that embarrassed her enough to shove him away. She asks him what that was all about, and he replies, A wish. A wish to stay on this side just a little longer. On another morning, on the way to school, Himari runs into a boy with a weird shadow pulsating around him. She's then surprised when the boy tells her not to hang around him or else she'll get cursed. At school, the students speak in hushed whispers in disbelief that he had actually come to school. When Himari asks Rui about it, we learn the boy's name is Hayato Hidaka. He's got one of those cool, don't talk to me vibes. And there's a rumor going around that if you get near him, you'll get sick or hurt. Tadashi then mentions that Hayato used to be very outgoing, but one day his personality suddenly changed, and he started saying odd things about a childhood friend who disappeared. And even though Rui continues to dismiss all these things as silly rumors, Tadashi adds that Hidaka's family is known as a Tsukimono clan. But to get more info, she should ask Nachi-sensei, who is well informed on Japanese folklore. In his office, Nachi-sensei explains that the Tsukimono clan members employ Ayakashi from generation to generation, including yokai like foxes, dogs, snakes, and many beast-like spirits. And even though they're a wealthy family, they're often despised or discriminated against for having extraordinary and unknown talent when it comes to handling spirits. Luckily, Hayato's family in particular didn't face much discrimination, since they were great friends with the Momochi family. The Momochis often acted as spiritual mediators that helped many other families. Nachi-sensei had even heard Himari's parents, as the previous heads of the house, were a very kind couple that loved to help others. This leaves Himari to wonder if she can learn more about her family by visiting Hayato's house. She heads to his place, and an ominous wind blows her way. She decides to look around and finds a shrine she's compelled to touch. But as she goes to reach for it, Hayato stops her. He asks what she's doing here and she explains she came to visit because she heard their families were close. However, he knows nothing and tells her to leave, as a mysterious being watched them from within the shrine. On their way home, she gets startled hearing a distorted voice telling her to stay away from Hayato, and he sees a little fox spirit that she tries to talk to, but it just disappears with the wind. Back at home, Himari talks about the events with the fox Ayakashi and Hayato. This surprises Aoi because he and Hayato were actually childhood friends. So she connected the dots that the childhood friend Hayato was so saddened he had lost was none other than Aoi. But that doesn't matter, since there's no way he'd actually remember Aoi now that he's the guardian of the Momochi house. Himari asks if Aoi would like to meet with him again, but with a false smile, Aoi tells her he's fine not seeing his old friend again. 
After all, he's part of a different world now. This saddens her, causing Aori to ask what's wrong. So she gives a false smile back, saying, It's nothing. That night, Hayato sleeps in a terrible sweat. He suddenly wakes up, wondering why he can't remember the friend that he lost. In the morning, he heads out to school, only to be greeted by Himari. Even though he tells her to leave him alone, Himari refuses because she knows he only keeps away from others to make sure the spirits around him don't hurt them. This is when he explains that his family actually lost the ability to see apparitions in his grandparents' generation. So even though his family can't see any spirits, he still feels as if something is possessing him. Himari asks why that is, so he elaborates the pact he made by pulling out a book containing some four-leaf clovers, something that a friend gave him long ago. Someone that he used to be really close with, but he for some reason can't remember his face or name. They were inseparable and spent all their time together. And yet, one day, the friend began avoiding him. So Hayato came up with the idea of giving him a matching four-leaf clover charm. He had looked for one as hard as he could. That's when he heard the voice. The voice from the shrine offered to grant Hayato's wish in exchange for his most treasured possession. He was granted the clover, something he had hoped to use to patch things up with his dear friend again. But it was worthless, because the friend vanished like he never existed, and no one else remembered his name or his face. Hayato believed he had done something horrible. He believed he traded his best friend for a stupid, trivial wish. He felt a deep remorse and blamed himself for everything. But Himari dismisses this, saying she believes his friend to still be around, and they'll figure out how to lift this curse together. Back at her house, after recounting Hayato's story to Aoi, Aoi comes to the conclusion the day Hayato had made the pact was probably the same day he wandered into the Momochi house. And the fox mask spirit must be the head of the shrine at Hayato's place that's washed over the Hidaka family for the entire time. Himari wonders why the fox would choose to curse Hayato. And Aoi answers it's most likely because Hidaka's family can't see the spirit anymore, as employed spirits need to be worshipped properly, otherwise they will bring misfortune to the families they serve. To help, Himari heads over to Hayato's place to help clean the shrine for proper worship. She then removes the seal, revealing all the fox spirits, but Hayato can't see them at all. The spirits are mad because they've been trapped in the shrine without proper treatment for many years. They ask why the Hidaka family abandoned them, and Himari explains to them that Hayato's family can't see them, and offers to take them into her house. They are more than happy to, since there's someone that can finally speak to them again. But their older brother isn't happy. He comes in with the desire to eat Himari, that way he can become powerful enough for Hayato to see him. He strikes, but the other spirits choose to defend Himari. Then Himari and Hayato run to her house, but the fox mask catches up to them. The fox mask attacks them, knocking them into the house gates. But this is the jurisdiction belonging to Nue, and in the house of Momochi, the spiritual power is so strong Hayato can see the fox spirit as well now. Nue strikes the little fox, revealing the face of a young Aoi underneath. Nue begins his attack to wipe him from existence, but Hayato tells him to stop. He apologizes to the fox spirit for not being able to see him all this time, and he empathizes with the fox, as it only granted him his wish in hopes that Hayato would see him. The fox was sad because no matter how much he called out, Hayato would never answer. He felt lonely, which is why he thought he needed more power, but he knew deep down he needed to stop. He gave Hayato back his most treasured possession, his memories of Aoi. Then Nue explains that it was only a remnant, and that the fox spirit had never taken away his friend, just only the memories from that time, and that Hayato isn't at fault for the disappearance of his friend. Hayato then asks where Aoi is, but is disappointed to learn from Nue that he's no longer part of the human world. Hayato begs Nue to take him to where Aoi is, but Nue just decides to knock him out. Transforming back to his human form, Aoi gets nostalgic looking at the friend he hasn't seen since he was a child. The next morning, Himari visits Hayato and he thanks her for all the help with the fox spirit. When she tells him he won't have to worry about the spirits or Aoi anymore, Hayato responds by asking who Aoi is. Then Himari remembers Aoi saying to Hayato while he was asleep that this time he'll make sure Hayato forgets everything. Himari wells up with sadness, knowing Aoi has chosen to continue to isolate himself from his best friend, but she puts on her false smile and accepts his decision. Blood and burning, Yukari wakes up in sweat, wondering just what that vision was. 
Morning comes and we see two Ayakashi begging for Aoi's help because a water hole has been tainted. But this is not normal poisoning, as springs in the spiritual realm are holy, sourced by Lord Ryujin, who protects the springs so they never dry and water stays pure eternally. So it should be impossible for one to go bad in the first place. Yukari reports that he can't sense Ryujin's presence or hear his voice, something he'd normally be able to do as he gained his powers as an Ayakashi from Ryujin. Yukari takes them to a spring on the border between the human and spiritual realm. This very place is where Yukari went from being human to an Ayakashi. No one usually enters these springs as it's guarded by Lord Ryujin. However, Yukari has no idea where he is. He begins to fall, sensing something is wrong here. It's tainted water, the kind that rots the flesh of Ayakashi. And the spring has now become black and murky. Yukari then faints in Issei's arms. The gang watches over him, concerned that his spiritual power seems to be fading. And if this persists, he'll disappear. Himari searches for answers on how to help him. She recalls Yukari mentioning that in order to speak to Lord Ryujin, one must either be his kin or a sacrifice to him. So she wonders what would happen if she sacrificed herself. Aoi tells her she mustn't. And Yukari, who's barely hanging on, tells her Aoi's right. Because sacrificing herself would mean she'd be offering her soul. Later that night, Aoi burns his powers to try to call Lord Ryujin, but to no avail. With his lack of success, Himari appears ready to sacrifice herself, but Aoi shouts at her that he said no. He calms down, apologizing for lashing out at her. But Himari understands he's just worried for his friend. Aoi then explains Yukari was the first Ayakashi he had met, and the one who had helped him when he wandered into the Momochi house. Someone who had really supported him when he was lost and didn't know what to do. Himari thinks of Yukari as family as well, which is why she's ready to sacrifice herself. Aoi denies her, however, as Lord Ryujin is a much greater Ayakashi, and their words probably won't mean anything to him. However, she's fully ready to because there's no other way. Aoi accepts this and holds her close. He just didn't want to put her in harm's way because if she were ever to be in danger by anyone, even Lord Ryujin, Aoi would purge and put any foe to rest. The two then continue their embrace, with Himari promising not to be reckless. The next day, Himari is prepared for the sacrificial ritual. Aoi begins his chant to sacrifice her, and out from the black water comes a tainted Ryujin. It seems he is not being tainted, but is instead tainting the water himself. Leaving Aoi no choice, Ryujin must be cleansed. However, Himari begs to speak with the dragon Ayakashi and gets swept by the crashing waves. Aoi begins to go after her, but suddenly Yukari appears begging Aoi to release him from their contract. That way, he can calm Ryujin and save Himari himself. Yukari is then released into his true form and dives into the water, finding Himari passed out inside of an air bubble. As Yukari takes her away, Himari has visions of Yukari's past. She begins crying and Yukari explains those were fragments of his memories from long ago. When he was young, he didn't understand the hearts of others. He had been raised to assassinate the Emperor in his distant past, but the Emperor was ultimately murdered by someone else. And his killers eventually came after Yukari as well. Yukari somehow defeated them all, but was vilified as a man-eating killer for it. And eventually, he was forced to pay for the crime of the Emperor's murder, being sacrificed to Lord Ryujin as punishment. Something Yukari doesn't think much of now, accepting it all as fate. On that fateful day he was sacrificed, Ryujin spared him for some reason and brought Yukari back to life as his own kin, a Mizuchi or water spirit. He spent many years at the spring with Lord Ryujin, but one day he was told to go to the Momochi house and never to return. But since then, no matter how much Yukari called him, he hadn't been able to see Ryujin, and to this day still wonders why his lord had ordered him to serve the Momochi house. Himari surmised it might have been because he seemed lonely, and that Lord Ryujin must have sent him to the Momochi house where he could meet others. Yukari realizes things have certainly changed since meeting Aoi and the others, and acknowledges the loneliness he had felt previously. Himari knows Yukari as a kind person, something she believes Ryujin must also think. So she wants to restore the dragon back to his pure form so that they can find out why he pushed Yukari away. Himari and Yukari charge forward and attempt to subdue Lord Ryujin. Ryujin just says, it's dark, cold, and that he's lonely. Himari sees a talisman on him and takes it off, bringing the corrupted dragon back into the light. They converse with Ryujin and Himari was right. He just wanted Yukari to find friends and be freed of his loneliness. To keep him from coming back, Ryujin hid himself and closed off their connection. Yukari felt foolish for not noticing how much Ryujin cared for him. However, Ryujin himself became so consumed in loneliness 
he failed to notice a curse had been placed upon him by another being. But with his power restored, he purifies the dark waters, with Yukari promising to visit again sometime. With the day coming to a successful end, Yukari swears his loyalty once again to his master Aoi. But it's not over as Aoi touches Himari's face to say he's going to be punished later. On another day, Himari prepares to take off for school. However, Aoi sees her face is red and wonders if she has a fever. But she says she's fine and takes off. In class, even with the teaching lecture, all she can think about is how flustered she was with Aoi getting up close to her. It's nothing new for Aoi to get in her personal space. So why now does she feel so weird about it? Rui passes Himari some notes saying that Himari's face is totally red and she's spacing out. She must be thinking about her crush. Himari tries to deny this to herself because Aoi is like family to her. She's telling herself there's no way she can like him. But then she gets abruptly called by Nachi-sensei who asks if she brought today's homework that's due. But she forgot. So... He asks her to clean up the ancient literature prep room today after class, to which she embarrassingly accepts. The whole gang joins in to help Himari clean up, with Tadashi excited to learn more occult things from Nachi-sensei. Upon opening the ancient literature prep room, they all conclude their teacher is a total weirdo, and Nachi-sensei is a little embarrassed himself that he let things get this messy. They do their best to help organize things until Himari finds this strange mirror. Nachi-sensei says it's known as the looking glass, a mirror that shows people what they desire to see the most. She looks at it with the desire to see what's inside of Aoi's heart, but unfortunately, it's too dirty to see anything within it. After cleaning, Himari heads home a little worn out, but finds herself welcomed by her parents? And she even greets them back like it's nothing. The family chats about their day, with Himari saying she had to stay late to clean because she forgot her homework. However, she now feels something is off, just like we all do. She asks her father if he went to work today, and he tells her he got the day off so they can be together forever. She then hears a man's voice say, Jesting carry too far is all but annoying, and appearing before her in black flames is Kasha. He tells her the human eye is no better than a marble, clouded by sweet dreams, easily led astray from the truth. He thinks of this all as foolish and disappears. Her parents ask her what's wrong. She says, nothing, and fake smiles because her mother says dinner is fried tofu tonight. She then asks her parents if they're already dead, and they begin spazzing out bizarrely, saying they can all be together forever with her. They then chase after Himari as she runs. She makes it into another room, now understanding those disgusting creatures are not her parents. She sees something sparkle. Oh, it's Nachi-sensei's looking glass. But then, a door slams open with her parents repeating that they'll be together forever. From behind Himari, flames roast the parents to a crisp, and we see Issei and Yukari have arrived at the scene. They make it to a room that Yukari has protected with a barrier, so they'll be safe for now. They all seem to be trapped in this place which seems different from the regular Momochi house. Himari thinks this must be the work of Kasha. However, Yukari says she doesn't need to concern herself with that because as long as she stays here, she'll be safe. The two Shikigami smile strangely, so Himari asks where Aoi is, but Issei tells her to forget about him. He's fine. No, something is wrong. These two would never say to forget about Aoi at a time like this. They then both assure her they're her friends in strange distorted voices. She then dips out of the room knowing those two are not her friends, until she runs into her burnt parents. They then approach her until Aoi purifies them. He made it in the nick of time and concludes this must all be the work of Kasha. Aoi spots the mirror and asks about it, so Himari explains the purpose of the looking glass. He then asks whose heart she wants to see into, and when she blushes, unable to answer, he wonders if it's his heart she wants to see. He then holds her close, saying she doesn't need to use something like that to know how he feels. He just wants her to stay by his side, and she also wants the same. But upon hearing her answer, he asks Himari if he can trap her here for all eternity, to live with him in the Momochi house forever. She can't though, because she promised to help free him. She then backs away, realizing the man before her isn't the real Aoi. And she'd be right, because now both Nue and Aoi stand before her, whispering sweet nothings of them all falling into a peaceful eternal slumber together. She tells them to let her go and they dissipate. Then from inside the mirror is a demonic reflection of her, asking why she resists, since this world is a reflection of her heart's desires. Darkness then wraps around her, and a reflection comes out to say she can live happily with mom and dad. 
This is everything she's always wanted. Then, more of the dark clones come out from the shadows, saying she's always wanted a family. In this world, she doesn't need to think anymore. But Himari knows those things are not her parents. The shadows then prey on her insecurity, as she just barged into the lives of Aoi, Issei, and Yukari. How could they just accept her, a useless, helpless human? Especially when she always needs them to save her. Himari denies this, even knowing at times that Aoi lies and keeps important details from her. She continues to have faith that he wants what's best for her. The mirror then replicates Aoi again, telling Himari this version of him can understand her heart wholly, even better than the real Aoi. The clones of everyone Himari wishes to be close to appear and beckon her to stay, but she refuses. She doesn't want to live out the same day for eternity. The mirror starts to crack and breaks when Kasha burns everything before her. She wonders why he saved her, so he tells her not to flatter herself. With Nue being a beautiful blend between a human and Ayakashi, he hated seeing a crude imitation of him. He then asks what Himari's plans are, and it's to go back to the real Momochi house, of course. He then hints to her that mirrors are deceitful like snakes, merely tools to reflect desires of the heart and reach them, and he disappears. She then sees the mirror in front of her and tells it she wants to go home because she needs to tell Aoi something. She sees him waiting for her and reaches out. She awakens, wondering what has happened, and Nachi-sensei explains with one glance at the looking glass, she suddenly collapsed, but well, only for a few minutes. She heads home, running as fast as she can, unsure of if what had happened was real or a dream, but there's one thing she now knows for sure. Her feelings are no dream or delusion. She makes it in the gate. And Aoi asks why she's in such a rush. She takes a deep breath to tell Aoi that she's in love with him, something he's certainly surprised to hear. Aoi breathes lightly saying, I'm sorry, I can't see you that way, Himari. And the two just stare in silence. A few days later, breakfast is prepared. Red bean rice, red sea bream, and Issei lobster. Yukari had prepared her a consolation meal for getting rejected. And Issei comes in shouting that she needs to cheer up as he wrote a folk song to commemorate her taking an important step in adulthood. He summons his Ayakashi and begins to chant, You got rejected and rejected again. Might as well dance and forget. Get up and dance to lift that weight off your heart. <laughs> but clearly this isn't helping her. Issei continues his rejection song until Himari pounds the table saying to stop, and they freeze now realizing what they've done. Aoi then appears smiling like usual saying, it sure is like a festival every day, just rubbing more salt in the wounds. Himari thinks that it has been a few days now, but Aoi is acting so normal. Nothing has changed. Is it because he thinks of her just as family? Or is it because emotionally he's still a 10 year old? She gets saddened because either way, Aoi doesn't think of her romantically. Then suddenly a loud crash happens. Ayakashi appear outside as a seal has been broken. Aoi tries to rectify this with a talisman, but it dissipates. Himari asks if something is wrong and he says he's fine, only to get piled on by a ton of Ayakashi. However, he's still fine, of course. She learns from Issei and Yukari that Aoi's been in a slump. It's hard to tell why, but his seals haven't been working lately. Uh, huh. But because of this, Ayakashi have been swarming the house. Himari shoos the Ayakashi away and the three of them mope because her kicking them out doesn't solve the root of the problem. Aoi apologizes for causing so much trouble, but he just can't figure out what's wrong. Himari sits by him, asking if he's okay and if he's not feeling well. She goes to reach her hand towards him and he gets startled, but then gives his usual smile saying it's fine because time should resolve the problem. A big cat Ayakashi comes bursting shouting, how can you be so hopelessly optimistic, referring to Aoi. Aoi hugs Granny Cat, as it's been a long time. The cat wonders why the house is in this state, because it's causing a lot of buzz in the spirit realm. They say Momoshi House is basically free to enter nowadays. It'll only be a matter of time before evil ones start to roam about the place. Granny Cat reassures him, however, telling him to turn that frown upside meow, as he can leave it to her for now. She calls her cat familiars to start catching the wild Ayakashi, and Himari watches in excitement as they work. After cleaning the house, Granny Cat gets to business. She drops folders on the table because it's time for him to get a wife? Every folder is filled with different Ayakashi princesses of noble lineage, meticulously selected by Granny Cat. Aoi appreciates the gesture, but says it's too early for him, 
getting cut off by Granny saying, that's nonsense. She says his Ayakashi rite of passage isn't complete without a wife. If he doesn't follow through, the Momochi house may cease to exist. Himari butts in, however, telling Granny, Aoi can't marry an Ayakashi because he's human. But Granny asks what she could possibly know about him, and no one offers any further rebuttal. Himari thinks about what Granny Cat had said at school. Lost in thought, she wonders if there's merit to what the cat had said. Her friends call out to her to talk about some superstition. Tadashi tells of a rumor of a mysterious man in a school uniform that appears in Kagome Park at the edge of town and snatches children, and says it's time for them to investigate. Hidaka comes in to say they probably shouldn't. He thinks he once saw the man when he was a kid. He doesn't think it's a ghost, but for some reason he can't remember much else, leaving her wondering if this has something to do with Aoi. At home while cleaning, she thinks about how everyone can't remember Aoi. But what about the whole Nanamori family he's from? She sees Granny Cat wandering about, shouting that he needs to come out of hiding and finish choosing a wife from the album already. Granny Cat, who refers to Himari as a maidservant, comes in to assess her cleaning. The Ayakashi Cat stomps, making dust fall onto the ground, ruining all of Himari's hard work. But it's meaningless to Granny Cat as she expects perfection by morning. Otherwise, Himari will be demoted from maidservant to canned food. Himari is completely worn out after finishing room 37. Yukari offers her food for a break and apologizes as he's unable to help her, but she's fine since this is the only way she can make up for depending on them all the time. He explains Granny Cat being an ancient Ayakashi, she can be difficult at times, but truly means no harm. Aoi met her when he was still young and took to her, so she visits from time to time caring for him like her own child. Himari can understand that the cat is acting this way because she must really care for Aoi. Yukari then explains Aoi's slump was most likely caused by when he rejected her, but he has probably yet to realize it himself. However, Granny Cat seems to have been eavesdropping, hearing their conversation. She calls Himari saying she lost a very important hair ornament that was a gift from her mother. So Himari offers to help and they search all around the house, while Granny Cat secretly keeps the ornament tucked in her fur. She then tells Himari she must have dropped it in the pond. And as Himari takes off, Granny Cat laughs because she must have gotten Himari to give up. However, that isn't the case because Himari goes out to the pond to search for the flashlight. Granny Cat wonders why Himari wants her approval so badly. And Himari answers that with it being an important gift from a family member, she promises to find it. Granny Cat leaves mad, unable to provoke Himari, saying she's tired and going to bed. As Himari continues to search, she falls in the water, but Aoi catches her. He apologizes because he'd been so busy hiding, he hadn't noticed what Granny Cat was putting her through. He wipes Himari's face because it's wet and tells her to call it a night because she'll catch a cold searching in this pond. He'll just get Granny Cat a new hair ornament later, but Himari refuses because she wants to keep searching. Her diligence makes Aoi smile, so he rolls up his sleeves and offers to help. He asks why she's always like this and she answers that because the gift was an important one from Granny Cat's mother, she feels like she has to help. She then asks if Aoi has anything important he's kept from his family. He pauses and then gets up with his usually over-optimistic answer, saying that what's important to him is the time he has with everyone here at the Momochi house. However, when she asks him about his family from before again, he gets more serious, saying that he supposes he's forgotten he had anyone like a family before. Next day, Aoi and the gang fend off a malicious Ayakashi, and afterwards, he falls exhausted, all while Himari had watched from afar. Himari sits atop the roof, seeming a little down. Granny Cat asks what she's doing, but Himari apologizes for not having found the hair ornament yet. But never mind that, Granny Cat says she came here to pull Aoi out of his slump, so she needs Himari to do something else now. So, they have a surprise hot pot, where everyone put their own ingredients in. Aoi grabs the first piece of food, and he's glad it's this tofu pouch that was made by Yukari, but then suddenly breathes fire because it's filled with extra hot chili sauce. Issei pulls out, what kind of fish is this? And Yukari tells him whatever the chopsticks touch, he gotta eat, and he sobs over the fish. As they all enjoy the hot pot, Aoi thanks Himari because he's never done something like this before, and it's all so fun. But then a daikon Ayakashi wants to be stewed as well, so he jumps in spilling the soup everywhere. Aoi had landed on top of Himari to protect her from the boiling soup, and the two stare face to face. As he moves off of her, she begins to see Nui and pulls him in close. 
Aoi wonders what's wrong, but she says, it's nothing. With the lights back on, Yukari wonders what those two were doing, but they deny anything had happened, saying it's not what he thinks. The next morning, Himari sits to herself, wondering if seeing Nue in that moment was just a mirage. Then, Granny Cat comes in, surprising Himari, thinking she's looking pretty down. Himari wonders what Granny Cat is doing up so early, and she tells Himari that it's time for her to head back into the spirit realm. Himari is concerned because they've yet to find the ornament yet, but Granny says it's fine since it's suddenly turned up. Granny Cat then hands it to Himari. It's said that this winter cherry lantern can light the way of the truth, but only once. Granny Cat remarks that Aoi seems lost, not just from being in a slump, but ever since he wandered into the Momochi house. She knows Aoi is probably hurting from not being able to leave, so he might as well forget all of his past and fully embrace becoming an Ayakashi. Himari doesn't believe he should just forget forcefully, but sees Granny Cat has already disappeared. But with Granny Cat's voice echoing through the walls, she asks if Himari can be the one to light the way for him. Himari doesn't know if she herself will be able to help Aoi, but she desperately wants him to find his way home. At school, Nachi-sensei explains the Nanamori house isn't anywhere on this map. He wonders why Himari is asking about him. She takes off, saying, it's nothing. And we see Nachi-sensei looking at his reflection in the window. And after taking off his glasses, he wonders how much Aoi has grown up. We see Aoi finishing one of his purity rituals until he gets called by Yukari. Aoi asks where Himari is, noticing she's out late today, and ponders after hearing she's out in Kagome Park, a place Aoi is very familiar with. Yukari then brings up Aoi's slump from earlier, suggesting there is another reason other than rejecting Himari's confession, causing Aoi to stare flabbergasted after Yukari asks if there's something he's afraid of. We move to Himari and friends investigating the creepy Kagome Park. It was a place kids used to play at, but all the talk of ghosts must have scared them away. Rui then announces that since they haven't found any ghosts or kidnappers like the legends say, it's time to go home. And those are some famous last words if I've ever heard them. An ominous wind blows and a creepy voice sings, <laughs> talkings that are clear yet like a whisper. The voice counts, one, two, three, four. Four is an unlucky number. It brings death. So the voice suggests death to one of the students. A being then appears behind Himari. So Rui smacks the man and it turns out it's just Tadashi playing tricks on them. The friends all have a good laugh after finding out Tadashi was the one who was perpetuating the idea of the kidnapping spirit in Kagome Park. Himari then asks him where he found his cape, but huh? For some reason he can't seem to remember. As Himari and Hayato walk home together, they discuss Tadashi's strange behavior. Hayato remembers seeing a strange man in the past in the park, but every time he tries to recall the incident, he only draws a blank. He does feel though that something really, really bad happened. He hates that he can't seem to remember a lot from his childhood, making Himari feel bad that Aoi forcibly took his memories away. The two say their goodbyes for the evening, and when Himari makes it past a gate in the Momochi house, she hears Tadashi's voice make the Kagome chants again. She's not going to be tricked this time though. But something is off. Tadashi has a wicked smile on his face. He then refers to himself, saying, Since this child was invited to the Momochi house once, he thought he'd be able to enter with him. He then goes for an attack, and when Aoi and his gang come in, Himari is wrapped in disgusting tentacles. Aoi then transforms into Nue, but Himari stops him because she doesn't want Aoi to hurt Tadashi. So, he commands Issei and Yukari to subdue the possessed boy, and they're able to free Himari. Aori then expels the spirit out of Tadashi's body, and before he can go for the finishing blow, the spirit says, I wonder how much Aoi has grown, making Aoi stare slightly agape. He remembers a man approaching him in his youth with that cape. Then, the spirit dissipates into black feathers, while uttering, The path has been cleared. Inside, the Ayakashi huddle around Himari, freaked out by the black feathers around the house. She reassures them though, since Aoi and the gang are looking into it. Issei returns having thrown Tadashi back to his house. Yukari then reports that after having searched everywhere, there's nothing to report in the house. Even having assessed evil intent within the black feathers, the presence is totally gone. Aoi then expresses frustration, remembering the spirit had addressed him directly. Himari asks him what's wrong, but he says, it's nothing like usual. Yukari then explains the cape that possessed Tadashi was a Tsukomogami, 
a type of ayakashi created when an object gains a soul and spiritual powers over time. Suspecting it used Tadashi as a medium to get into the Momochi house to consume Himari for power. Later, Aoi finds Yukari in a room, trying to find other Sukomogami residing in their house that can help give clues about the cape. Yukari is still worried because even though they aren't finding anything, he still can't shake this ominous feeling he's having. He then says, Goodness, I'm starting to sound like a human, aren't I? Prompting Aoi to ask what it feels like for a human to turn into an Ayakashi. Yukari responds that he didn't feel a definite change, but at first, everything felt distant. Distant from feelings of sadness, suffering, and even love for others. He then asks Aoi if he ever intends to become a full Ayakashi. Being mortal burdens Aoi physically and mentally. Yukari believes by giving up his human self, his pain would probably wash away. Aoi agrees he may fully become Nui at some point, and even though Yukari suggested it with a saddened look, he questions if that really is what is best. Wondering if Aoi would truly be at peace letting his memories go to protect the Momoji house. Late at night, Aoi stares at the window, contemplating his resolve to fully become Nui, giving up his humanity. Himari finds him asking what he's doing up so late. He makes the excuse that with the wind blowing so hard, he couldn't sleep. And Himari happened to be up because she was making sure the lesser yokai were able to rest, being spooked from the afternoon events. While yawning, Aoi hugs her from behind, making her blush. As he whispers, will you help put me to bed too? She calls him out because he's making her feel embarrassed, but his face has depression written all over it. He's unsure of what path he needs to take. Himari turns to him and smiles, telling him it's alright, we're all here with you. He then breathes a sigh of relief and chuckles, then gives her a hug and thanks her for helping him realize what's important to him. They stare face to face, and as Aoi and Himari are about to kiss, a black feather drops before them. A creepy voice comes from the feather, asking Aoi how long he's going to keep him waiting. Aoi and Himari then run to the Momochi house gate, where the feathers are gathering into a blue flame. The flames tell Aoi to think back. The more Aoi remembers, the stronger their tie becomes. Yukari and Issei try to help, but they get bounded by the feathers. Aoi then explains this isn't an Ayakashi's doing. As he remembers who the flames are, a face that Himari recognizes shows itself. And through the gate walks a man in a monk outfit. It's Nachi-sensei? Himari asks why he's here, but Nachi-sensei reveals his role as a teacher is just an alias. He then summons Shikigami and tells Aoi he feels sorry he's been trapped in the Mochi house all these years. He's come to free him by turning Aoi into his Shikigami. He pulls up a talisman, the same one he used to corrupt Lord Ryujin. Aoi then prepares for combat, but no, he can't transform. It's all going according to Nachi-sensei's plan. Returning to the past, in Kagome Park, in his youth, Takamura Nachi was bullied by his classmates because he claimed to be able to see ghosts. Even his parents scolded him for making up creepy nonsense. We turn back to the present, with Nachi Sensei claiming Aoi as his property now. He then raises his staff to strangle Issei and Yukari a bit, causing Aoi to question why he's doing all this. Nachi pretentiously responds that this is all fate. Back in the day, to gain the power to rule Ayakashi, Nachi searched constantly for the Momochi house, but he could never reach it. Only those suited to become the house guardian are welcomed. However, he personally didn't qualify as a candidate. When he realized he wasn't fit, he began to search for someone who was. Day in and day out, he would look for children until he found Aoi. Aoi asked if the Shikigami were his friends, and at that moment, Nachi-sensei had figured Aoi would be a fine candidate. They would hang out together in Kagome Park after Aoi's classes. Because Aoi was so interested in learning more from Nachi about Ayakashi, Aoi confided in Nachi because the other students also bullied him for being able to see spirits. The two had common ground. Even Aoi's parents scolded him for the creepy ghost talk. They even told him he was going to ruin their family. The boy cried, giving Nachi the chance to be a slimy snake, gaslighting Aoi into believing everyone would be better off without him, and that he should go to the Momochi house, telling Aoi that if he hid there, his parents would surely come looking for him. But if they didn't, Nachi would come find him instead. Aoi turned out to be just as talented as Nachi had hoped for all those years ago. However, taming him in his new A form would have proved too challenging. This is where Himari fitted into his plans. Because of her, Aoi's heart began to waver, 
making him desire to reclaim his human side. So much he couldn't maintain balance. She's been doing everything according to his plans. He was the one who gave her her parents' will and testament to own the house. Something that Nachi claims is fate, woven by his hands. Nachi then entangles Aoi in the feathers, and Himari gets blown back trying to free him. He beckons Aoi once again to become his Shikigami. He knows the Momochi House Guardian has the power to command all Ayakashi roaming the human world, and the ability to bring peace and order to all people. He then uses his staff, making everyone but Himari disappear. Himari searches the house, and no one is anywhere to be found, until she hears Kasha say, it's no use. Nui and the others are being held in that raven's cage, somewhere out of human reach. In the barrier of black feathers, Aoi begs Nachi to let Yukari and Issei go, but Nachi responds pretentiously, telling Aoi he has such a kind heart. He kneels down and expresses that Ayakashi are nothing but invaders polluting the human world. Humans born without power have always lived in fear of them. He believes Ayakashi that threaten order need to be eliminated. Humans belong in the human world, Akashi belong in the spirit realm. He wants Aoi's powers to make this happen. Back at the Momochi house, Kasha explains that this house acts as a barrier between the human world and the spiritual realm. The human's world Yang and the spiritual Yin. The magic of this house blocks the two off from one another. Kasha surmises that Nachi excels in separating worlds, reminding Himari of the looking glass. Kasha doesn't like Nachi a lowly human daring to set foot in the world of Ayakashi. He tells Himari that in order to reach them, she'll need to figure out how to get to the spiritual realm. However, mortal bodies cannot cross. They then hear something rattling in a nearby drawer. Oh, it's the winter cherry lantern Granny Cat gave to Himari. Remembering it can light the way of truth just once, she enters the spiritual realm with the lantern lighting her way to a gate. And Ayakashi then pulls her close, saying she smells tasty and would go good with some wine. But he suddenly falls depressed because he's all out of sake. Recovering from his failed meal prospect, he reveals himself to be the gatekeeper. Himari begs him to let her in, because she needs to find her friends. He apparently knows who she is and decides to let her through for a price. He needs her soul. However, the lantern shatters and feeds the gatekeeper. With his fine taste, he accepts it as her offering. So he opens the gate and inside, Himari finds the storeroom of all memory, the shelf of hearts. People's destinies, their karma, everything concerning a human lies here. If she searches for the memories of the person she's looking for, she'll be able to find them. She then calls for Aoi's drawer, but it seems she cannot open it. The gatekeeper laughs, saying she must desire something else then, and we see Himari's memory drawer. Himari is tempted to find memories of her parents, but decides it's more important to have Aoi's drawer right now. However, every time she reaches for it, it eludes her grasp. The gatekeeper warns her, the shelf of hearts can only be opened once. If she chooses to open Aoi's, she may never have her questions about her parents or her origins answered. Regardless, she still chooses Aoi's drawer over her parents. She's doing this to show her parents that she's the type of girl who protects the people she loves, that they left behind a beautiful child. This resolve unlocks Aoi's drawer for her, so Himari thanks the gatekeeper, making him realize he likes her. He kisses her hair and tells her when they next meet again, they should drink sake together, blowing her a kiss goodbye. However, she just thinks he's a weirdo. Upon opening the drawer, she's flooded with cherry blossoms and a young Aoi who is ready to tell everything about his past. It's his father, a quiet man who spent a lot of time away from home for work. However, Aoi had a heartwarming affection for him, his, while his mother would love and comfort him. Then the day came when his mother had passed, and seeing Aoi suffer alone due to all of this made Himari sad. Eventually, Aoi met Takamura Nachi in Kagome Park. It was the first time Aoi had met someone who could see Ayakashi other than himself. When Nachi Sensei told him everyone might be happier if he just disappeared, Aoi thought to himself, he might be right. Since Ayakashi are drawn to me, I should distance myself from everyone and live alone. But returning home that day, he didn't want to leave them. He desperately wanted to get along with his mother. However, a childlike voice around her stomach began speaking to Aoi. Telling the young Aoi begins to smirk, telling her, Nachi Sensei couldn't believe a mortal with no powers could possibly pass through the spiritual realm. She admits she could have never done it on her own though. She got help from Granny Cat, 
Aika, the gatekeeper, and who she hates to admit, Kasha. Nachi thought of it as nonsense for Ayakashi to help a human, that human lives are turned upside down all because of Ayakashi. The fear of scorn from his own parents, the loneliness of no one understanding, he felt the only way to get rid of this pain is to eliminate Ayakashi altogether. He felt Aoi was just like him, the only one who could understand. However, human and Ayakashi, wondering which side he'll choose. After class, as Himari and friends walk through the hot summer, Hayato brings up that Nachi-sensei suddenly transferred, but don't they normally wait for break to start to do that? However, the only one really upset is Tadashi since they were occult buddies. Rui puts her arms around Himari to tell her there's a festival tonight at her house. They invite her out, but she has to decline them because she has important plans tonight. Himari comes home only to be surprised from behind by Aoi, who welcomes her. They're apparently throwing a great job party? Huh? They've also readied tons of sunflowers for the party as well, and Himari is surprised to see the house connected to somewhere so beautiful. She apparently loves sunflowers because they give happy summer vibes. She's always wanted to be like a sunflower since she was little. After all, Himawari, or sunflowers, always bloom toward the sun. Maybe that's why her parents named her Himari. They begin searching for more decorations for the party, with Yukari presenting some scary candles, like for ghost stories. Yukari then has to finish cooking, so he leaves the rest to Aoi and Himari. With it being just the two of them, Aoi brings up how she went to the shelf of hearts, and how choosing his drawer saved them all, but he knows she wanted to choose her own and learn more about her parents. However, she's fine because she accepts her decision. Aoi then brings up something he's been meaning to tell her. A long time ago, he found her parents' diary in this very storage room. It was a few years after he came to the Momochi house. Back when evil spirits ran rampant throughout the house after it had gone years without a master, he worked day and night to purge Ayakashi without knowing why he'd been selected as Nue. But daily, Yukari commended him for his work as the Omomori that ensured the well-being of the human world. Even with this encouragement though, everything was painful for Aoi. He thought things like, why did I have to be the one to do this? And how long would I have to keep doing it? The future felt like endless darkness and he couldn't find the light. Around that time, he discovered a diary that read, Even though I was born with the Momochi name, I have no spiritual power and I can't fulfill my purpose. It was a diary that belonged to the Momochis. The diary owner was just a normal human who could barely see Ayakashi, with the Momochi name being too heavy for her. But luckily, she found the man that she loved. The man could also not see Ayakashi. But even after learning about the Momochi house, he accepted her and wanted to be with her. At first, Aoi was just curious about their story. He wanted to know more about the woman who could see Ayakashi like he could. He was drawn in more and more by her and the story of her family. He had read about baby Himari, who ate too much it worried the mother. Baby Himari, who cried so hard she woke the parents up several times. But no matter how hard she cried, the parents loved her very much. Her mother wondered if she cried because she could see Ayakashi. With the Momochi blood running through her veins, no matter what though, her parents swore to protect her. These stories began to warm Aoi's cold heart. He revisited the diary several times, but one day, the book read, I can't handle this house any longer, but I can't get away, and black flames emerged. With Yukari putting them out, the book was already destroyed. From the book emerges a message with a womanly voice saying, she cannot stay by Himari's side any longer, but she loves the time they spent together. Yukari explains that it must be the author of the diary and her husband, who left trace amounts of spiritual power in the diary. They did not possess enough spiritual power to be selected as Nue, so they must have fallen prey to the evil collected by the house. They had left this diary for Himari, so no matter what troubles she faced, she could know peace would await her at the end. With that, the mother spirit came to Aoi with the words, I love you, and the spirits disappeared. This is when Aoi swore he lived to protect Himari. She remembered back in the beginning, when he had said if he couldn't protect Himari, his life would have been a waste. He felt guilty, being saved by her parents by stealing their final act of love for her. But Himari is crying tears of happiness, touching Aoi's heart. She knows that's where her mom's and dad's hopes are placed. She thanks him for connecting her to her parents, only wishing he had told her sooner. They begin their great job feast with a plethora of food. And a red bean soup fountain? Oh man. Issei is munching and saying, let's hear it for the legendary Himari got rejected theme. But she'd rather not hear it again. They all celebrate and have a good time. The celebration comes to an end 
but it can't end without fireworks. However, when Himari tries to light them, they won't light for some reason, so Aoi transforms into Nue, using his powers to make the fireworks burst. Light dragons share the skies as well. Aoi knew they were firework yokai. After noticing the dragons can be ridden, Himari drags Aoi to the biggest firework to hop on a light dragon with him. And riding along, they see the light of the town Aoi protected. Himari finds it beautiful, all thanks to Aoi's hard work at the Momochi house. That's why those lights never dim. As Yukari and Issei watch the spectacle, they believe one day Aoi may be able to return to the human world, thanks to Himari. Aoi recalls a part of the diary that read, so that her light may carry across even the farthest seas. That's the true meaning of her name. It's written with the characters for light and crossing oceans. Aoi finally understands now. He's been protecting the light that was the meaning behind her name, and she's been the one protecting him this entire time. He thanked her because he never had the courage to face his destiny. It's why he kept running away from her honesty and genuineness. She laughs, but is okay with it. After all, she knows he's a big liar anyways. However, he can finally express his true feelings. As their lips touch underneath the fireworks, he tells her he loves her. Wow, what a nice end to the series. I know the manga is finished, so maybe they'll continue. If you enjoyed, like this video and subscribe to my channel for more. Also, watch this next video. It's me, Comfy T. I'll see you all in the next one.